So here we are. We're at Parashat Emor, um, and uh, the Torah portion has a number of sections to it. Uh, the first part of the Torah portion is focused specifically on rules and regulations that apply to the priests um, and to nobody else. Um, so uh, the, uh, the beginning says, Emor, El Hakohanim, right? Um, so El Moshe, El Moshe, El Hakohanim, Haron. So tell the Kohanim that they have certain uh, rules and regulations that apply only to them, and they have to be very careful to abide by those rules and regulations. So there are rules about the fact that they are not allowed to become ritually impure. If they become ritually impure, then they can't do their work because somebody who's ritually impure can't come into the temple. So if you're an Israelite, you just wait. You wait until you, uh, you know, go to the mikvah. You know, if there's a time period that you have to be ritually impure and then you go to the mikvah and then you uh, are ritually pure again and then you do whatever, you know, if you want to bring a sacrifice. So you wait a week or you wait uh, a couple of weeks. Um, if you're, uh, you know, if you have any of those issues uh, like a, a, to be a leper, we're not using that word uh, accurately, but you know, a mitzvah, um, all the different kinds of things. If you come in contact with a dead person is the, is the main thing that they talk about here. So you don't go to the temple, but um, the priests are, are, they have to be in the temple. They are the only ones who can, who can do the work. They're the only ones who can uh, officiate uh, through the service. And of course, at the very beginning of the history of the priesthood, there were very few priests because it was only Aaron's family. So there was nobody to back them up. They had to maintain ritual purity as much as possible. So the source of ritual impurity is death. And uh, coming in contact with a dead person renders you ritually impure. You have to get the uh, mixture of the ashes of the red heifer mixed in with all kinds of other ingredients has to be sprinkled on you for uh, you know, a couple of times over in the course of a week. And then you have to go to the mikvah. And so you're out of commission for at least a week. Um, so they couldn't afford to have the, the priests not be available. So they're told that they're not allowed to uh, become, uh, to become in contact, to come in contact with, with the dead except for their immediate family, right? Except for their uh, spouse, if they're married, parents, uh, siblings, and children. The immediate connection, right? Not grandchildren, not uncles and aunts, and so on and so forth, just the immediate, immediate connection, that's allowed. And then for the high priest, even that's not allowed. The high priest is, has to be available um, 24 seven, and uh, they're not even allowed to do that. So that's one part of the, of the uh, very uh, stringent rules that apply only to the priests. And then we have uh, other things about who they can marry. Um, they, there are limitations to who, again, the regular priests can, uh, can only marry uh, certain classes of people. The high priest is even more limited in who he can marry. Um, and uh, then they're told that they also have to be very, very careful when they partake uh, of the different sacrifices of which they get a portion, they have to be careful also not to uh, render them impure, not to be impure when they eat those portions. Um, and then they are also told not to um, become ritually impure by eating dead animals, animals that haven't been slaughtered in the kosher way. So these are various kinds of details that, that are, are part of the, of the Torah portion. Then we have um, uh, general rules that apply to all Israelites, telling them that they should be careful about the sacrificial offerings that they give um, and uh, that they should be unblemished they should be of good quality. You can't give God, you know, your junk. You have to only give uh, the very good, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, animals that you have in, in, in your flock or if you buy one. And then we transition to um, a major section of the Torah, of this Torah portion, which <coughs> uh, 
brings it into our cycle of readings again and again. And that is because it has the Jewish calendar uh, um, described. So when we, so we read this Torah portion, this section, we read this Torah portion um, on, on, the, on the holidays, on Passover, on Shavuot, on Sukkot. So um, there's a whole long section um, on, uh, on, on the festivals, Shabbat, Rosh Chodesh, and the festivals. And then we also have, um, wait, did I, did I say that? Is that correct? The festivals for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, um, Shabbat. I don't think a Rosh Chodesh is mentioned. I don't think Rosh Chodesh is mentioned. Um, but the three pilgrimage festivals, Shabbat and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are mentioned. Then we have um, another a couple of rules about taking care of the temple and the offerings and so on. And then at the very end of the Torah reading, we have one of the very few stories that we find in the book of Leviticus. The book, the book of Leviticus is overwhelmingly a book of rules and regulations, but we have one story, we've dealt with it in, in, in past years, and that is the blasphemer, the person who curses God's name and what happens to them because part of the theme of our Torah reading is to maintain the sanctity of person, the sanctity of place, the, 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 the shrine, the, the temple, the sanctity of time, and the sanctity of God's name. Um, I counted it up. The word holy in one form or another in Hebrew, um, last week we had a Torah portion, Kedoshim, to you, be holy, right? Its name is holiness. So I counted last week, the word holy in its various forms comes out 12 times. In our Torah portion, um, it's something like 48 times that the, that the term is used one way or another. So there's an, an ongoing uh, focus on maintaining holiness and not letting holiness be damaged or be violated in any kind of way. Um, and, uh, you know, those are some of the rules that, we, that, that play into that concern. Yeah, Audrey. Can you define for me holiness? What, the, you know, these are rules that enable us to become holy mm -hmm. or to stay holy. Right. So are we inherently holy because of who we are? Um, and then we can desecrate ourselves, and then there are rules for fixing that, or 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 not. I mean, or you've really crossed lines. Um, so, is it about living within the halakha that per, that makes someone holy within so, a Jewish frame? Right. So, so um, last week. I touched on it a little bit in the Torah Sparks. I've discussed it. We've discussed the Torah in, in, in the you know, Torah study and also in a number of other Torah Sparks um, over the years that I've, that I've written. The, it's, it's a complicated question that you're asking. I know. <laughs> and, and no, and, I know. That's, and I'm excited to ask it because I'm confused. So, so let, me, let me disappoint you uh, right away. All right. And tell you that I'm not going to give you um, a, a fully... Uh, adequate answer. Um, the holiness um, is, a, is a quality that is akin to God, right? God puts that equation at the very beginning, become holy because I am holy. So God says, I am holy. And then now you can strive to be holy. So we're created in God's image. And that's all right, the very, very beginning of, the, of, of our, of our our Torah, right, Genesis. Um, so that is the statement that says we have the potential, the capability to be like God. We can try to imitate God. Now, last week's Torah reading said, you want to try to be holy? Here are a bunch of rules and regulations. This is part of what it means to lead a holy life. And it's a combination of issues. It's a combination of ritual service to God, being careful about sacrifices, being careful about Shabbat, 
maintaining these kinds of special uh, um, times <coughs> and, and activities that should be distinguished from other things. Right? So holiness uh, implies an effort to, to be a little bit more mindful, to pay attention more and not just let the flow of mundane reality just take over. Okay. I get so wait, that. I'm not, hey, I'm not finished and I'm still going to not, not, this is still not adequate. Um, so there's a combination of those ritual and spiritual kinds of ideas. And then there's a very heavy emphasis on interpersonal uh, relations. You can't be holy if you don't love your neighbor as yourself. You can't be holy if you take advantage of poor people. But the overarching idea of holiness is something that Nachmanides said, just following the Torah is not enough to make you holy because we have a, a great um, capacity, a talent for doing things without meaning it, for going through the motions, for doing something, but actually having a, you know, not, not getting the point of why it is that we're supposed to be doing something. So Nachmanides says the mitzvah, the added mitzvah, be holy, is on top of all the other following the rules of the Torah, you could theoretically follow the rules of the Torah and still be a terrible person. You could keep Shabbat to the letter of the law, but be a miserable human being. You could even give tzedakah, but not do it in a holy way. So you could discharge all of your theoretical responsibilities and you could avoid all the prohibitions, but you could still be a, a very shrunken soul. Mm -hmm. Holiness says that infuse what you do with that purpose, with that purpose of not just thinking about yourself, about going beyond yourself, about being generous to other human beings, about being generous to God about being generous to the world. So part of holiness, and I've, I've, I've quoted this many, many times in his name, Rabbi Shimon Shkup, one of the great 20th century uh, teachers of Judaism, he explained it. So many people think of holiness, holy people are ascetics. They go up on a mountain someplace and they keep away from everybody. And he says, no, he says, that's not what God does. When God says, be holy because I'm holy, what's the first thing we know about God? that God created the world. God gave. God went out of God's own self and didn't just think about one God's self. God created a world that God, in a certain sense, has no control over. And that's okay. So God created a world that God could then be in touch with, that God could relate to, that God could give the air and the sun and the, and, and the, and the water to every creature, whether they're good or bad. God just gives, 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 gives. So Rav Shimon Shkup says, that's what it means to be holy. To be holy is to be giving. And you know, the, uh, um, all the other things are commentary. So here, for instance, when a, when a priest has said, watch out, don't become ritually impure. So that could be a negative, right? Ooh, they have to be super careful. They have to be super... Uh, on, the, on, the, on the lookout, they can't go to a funeral. There's a lot of negative, right? But it's not about being negative. It's about make sure that you, are, you have a unique capacity to give certain things that nobody else can. Make sure that you can discharge that, that possibility. Make sure that you can give what only you can give. So that's the way he reframes holiness. And I think it's very important. So. Uh, um, Thank you. Thanks for, for asking the question. So all of this now leads us to what we're supposed to be uh, devoting ourselves to in our series of learnings, which is the Haftarah, the prophetic portion that was chosen uh, to partner up with this Torah reading. So as, I, as we just went through a whole long uh, series of discussions, the Torah reading has a lot of different pieces to it. What is the choice that was made? Uh, is the Haftorah going to be something that's going to connect up with all those pieces? 
or with only a, a couple of pieces or only one piece, what's the specific connection for the Torah reading to the Haftarah? We'll see. So the Haftarah, the prophetic reading is from Yechezkel, Ezekiel chapter 44. So this is toward the end of Ezekiel's uh, series of prophecies. It's on, in the Eitz Chaim, it's on page 735. Uh, and it's chapter 44, it begins on verse 15. Um, so these, uh, we've had some of this before, that Ezekiel uh, lived at the time right before and after the destruction of the first temple. And this prophecy is situated after the temple has been destroyed. And the end of the book of Yechezkel is this elaborate vision of the restoration of the temple that it ain't over just because the temple has been destroyed and we've gotten clobbered and, and, and exiled and everything is terrible. He lives in Babylonia. That's where he's giving these prophecies. He's not even in the land of Israel. Um, and he says, no, 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 we can't give up hope because there will be another temple. And let me describe it. He describes the physical aspects of the temple, he you know, how, it's, how it's built, the architecture and so on, the, the layout. And he gets into a lot of discussion about what happens in this temple. And now we will see that he's going to focus on, as the first words of the Haftarah begin, right? the Levitical priests. So he's going to focus now on those people who function in, who will function in the new temple. Again, this is all a message of hope because the priests have been decimated. The priests have been you know, taken away from, from, the, from their, their, their calling. There is no temple. Right now when he's speaking, everything is in ruins. The people of Israel are dispersed you know, far away from home. We have a Psalm you know, on the rivers of Babylon, there we sat and there we wept. So they're crying and they're uh, um, you know, in mourning and he's trying to give them this message that, no, no, it's all, we're gonna bounce back. We're gonna actually have uh, a new temple and uh, there'll, there'll be the sacrificial system again. Everything will be renewed. So let's see exactly what, um, what he pictures for us in this particular little section. It's not a long Haftarah. Um, and uh, somebody, uh, if you could read for us, that would be a very nice thing. Who'd like to read? I can. Okay, thank you. Now the Levitical priests descended from Zadok. Sadok. 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 Yeah. Who maintained the service of my sanctuary when the people of Israel went astray from me. They shall approach me to minister to me. They shall stand before me to offer me fat and blood, declares the Lord God. Okay. So um, actually, let's read um, another, another verse or so. Let's read the next verse too. Go okay. ahead. They alone may enter my sanctuary and they alone shall approach my table to minister to me and they shall keep my charge. Okay. So what Yechezkel is now saying is there are a number of priestly families, right? In the beginning, there was only Aaron and his sons. But then as time goes along, you know, the, the, uh, the, the family gets bigger and bigger and branches out and there are clans and so on and so forth. So there are different uh, um, streams of genealogy uh, of people who are priests. And what Yechezkel says now is when the new temple will be built, only one group from all the priests will be eligible to serve in that new temple. And that's only B'nai Tzadok, only the children who come from the line of Tzadok, not anybody else. Geraldyn, you wanted to say something. A question, is this after Aaron's sons died? This is long after, long okay. after. This is long, long, long after. This is hundreds of years later. Okay. Um, many, 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 many generations. There are a lot of priests now. Instead of only three priests, there are, Hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of priests. Yeah, uh, Audrey. Who is Sadok? So 
Um, if you look at look at uh, the no, the note at the bottom of the page, um, Tzadok. Got it. Did he come from the lineage of Aaron? Re read the note, please. Can you read out loud? Yeah, sure. The bottom of yes, the page. Yes, got it. This is the ancestral line of priests in Jerusalem. Sadok served as a bearer of the ark for David along with Abiathar. Right, Eviatar is the way it says in Hebrew. Abiathar. Sadok supported Solomon for dynastic succession, whereas Abiathar backed Adonijah. Adonia. 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 Therefore, it was Sadok who anointed Solomon king. Eventually, Solomon banished Abiathar, and Sadok remained the sole priest of the king. It is this old Jerusalemite priesthood that Ezekiel designates for the new temple program. According to biblical genealogies, priests of the second temple were of the Zad. Sadokite line, line up to the Hasmonean rebellion. The Hasmonean priests were not Sadokite. This led to internal divisions among the groups that constituted late Second Temple Jewry. Right. Okay. So this gives us a little bit of, a, of an inkling about the kind of uh, uh, discord, to borrow a word, that was going on. Uh, within the Jewish community, there were numbers of families of priests, and they, you know, drew their lineage back in time to uh, uh, mainly Sadok and Eviatar. Um, and the stigma on Eviatar was that he wasn't loyal to King David. When uh, King David had a son, um, Adonia, who tried to grab the monarchy when when uh, when David was in his on his last legs, and uh, and uh, you know the, the there was a kind of a coup d'état. He declared himself king, and uh, David was uh, had to be urged by the inner court that remained uh, faithful to him, loyal to him, to step up because he was just he was uh, really again kind of a doddering weak. Uh, um, figure at that point, and to stand up and and they and he's challenged. Are you going to uh, support your son Solomon? You made a promise that Solomon would be the king, not Adonia. So what's going on? So he he declares that Adonia will will not be the king, and Solomon will. But there there become there's a civil war, and the priesthood is split up. The priesthood is split up between uh, those uh, who follow Sadok's lead and who stay loyal to David. And the other priests who said, no, the right thing is that David is, is a has-been and his son has much more to uh, offer to the, to the people. And I mean, they didn't see themselves as traitors. They saw themselves as doing what was good for the people. They lost. So um, they can't be canceled in their priesthood. They, were always be, they would always be priests, but they were kicked out of serving in the temple. Now, um, this is again, hundreds of years after that, um, we, uh, we have uh, Yechezkel, Ezekiel, singling out the Tzadokite priests as the only priests who, who were loyal, not to David, but to God. And he accuses the other priests of being, uh, um, you know, not, not uh, good Jews and not serving uh, God. And therefore they don't deserve to be invited back into the temple. So when the temple uh, will be uh, uh, reinstated and renewed and rebuilt, only the Tzadokite priests will be allowed in. Now, the implication that we could uh, um, see from this, it, take from this is that well, if he's insisting on that, that means that somehow this exclusive hold by the Tzadokai priest was not so strong before the temple was destroyed. Because Yechezkel is making this like a new thing. And he says, after all, those other people, they caused the destruction of the temple. And now only the Tzadokai priests will be allowed to be the, the ministering priests. So again, all priests 
stay priests whether they like it or not and whether we like it or not. But now Yechezkel is saying that it's only the righteous priests who will be actually allowed to have work in the temple. So, but for instance, let's say another priest living in Haifa, you could go to that priest, let's say, to do a pidyon aben. You know, your firstborn son, you have to bring him to the priest and you have to, you know, do a, you know, redeem the son. So that priest could, could do it. Or you have, you have harvest and you have to take the first 2% of your, of your crops and you have to give it to the priest to eat. You can give it to any priest. It doesn't have to be a tzadokai priest. Um, so all the priests are, are uh, priests in quote unquote good standing, but they can't necessarily, according to Yechezkel, they won't be welcome to do, uh, to do these jobs, to be in the temple itself. And because the other ones were no good, the other ones were not and um, are responsible for letting the Israelites uh, stray from God, which brought the punishment of the, of the destruction of the temple. So he's blaming the other priests for their lack of leadership or for their betraying God and not <laughs> uh, leading the people uh, you know, in, the right, in the right way. So the Tzadokites are, um, are the only ones that, that pass muster. Okay. Was Ezekiel a Kohen? Um, was Yechezkel a Kohen? I kind of feel like he was, but I don't. might be misremembering now. And if so, which group was he? Yeah. I should know that. I'm sorry that I uh, can't answer. I'm looking it up. Here. Let's see. Yeah, he was, well, he says he was born into a priestly Kohen lineage. Yeah, I think he was. So now I'm curious as to what kind of Kohen he yeah, was. Yeah, Ben <laughs> Kohen, right there in the beginning, chapter three, chapter one, verse three. Right. So is he one of Which the family? I don't know. I don't know. It'd be really interesting. I feel yeah. like this is relevant when if you're going to write this down, <laughs> if you're going to prophesy this, your own, your own actual right. lineage becomes relevant right. now. Right. I mean, but as the note points out, he didn't invent this privileging of the tzadokites. Um, it's actually hundreds of years old that the tzadokites are the good guys. Yeah, although you said oh. it might not be as strictly but, uh, but followed. But obviously the Evyatarites didn't think so. Right. So, um, you know, it depends whose side you're on. And did the Hasmoneans ever, after the, you know, they threw off um, Antiochus and such, did they go into the temple? Were they yeah, temple yeah. priests? They, became, they took over the high priesthood. Okay. <laughs> yes. So that's, this is not that, a permanent thing anyway. That's hundreds of years after Yechezkel, right? Right. Just hit myself. Okay, good. All right, back to, back to our Haftarah. Okay. Verse 17. And when they enter the gates of the inner court, they shall wear linen vestments. They shall have nothing woolen upon them when they minister inside the gates of the inner court. They shall have li linen turbans on their heads and linen breeches on their loins and they shall not gird themselves with anything that causes sweat. When they go out to the outer court, the outer court where the people are, they shall remove the vestments in which they minister and shall deposit them in the sacred chambers. They shall put on other garments, lest they make the people uh, consecrated by uh, their vestments. By contact with their vestments. Contact, contact with their vestments. By, yeah, that's obviously in brackets. Um, so here we have now rules and regulations. Okay, now that I've defined who it is that's eligible to be the priest, what do they have to do? So what do they wear? They wear simple uh, vestments. The vestments must be, are, must be made <coughs> of linen, no wool. Now remember that we have a general prohibition of mixing wool and linen together, right, flax, and wool. Um, so uh, that's called shat maize, right? Or kilayim. So that's a prohibition in general. But so here he says they shouldn't wear any wool. He doesn't say mixed or anything, but, but and then he's got this idea that they shouldn't cause, <coughs> um, well, so first of all, that lines up with what we have in the Torah also. The regular priests all read, all wore, uh, linen garments. 
Um, and uh, so here it's the white garments, which we uh, might be familiar with, unfortunately, if we've seen what shrouds look like. Shrouds echo these, uh, these garments. Um, the high priest did not wear linen garments. The high priest wore an elaborate costume. And it's notable that Ichezkel doesn't mention any of that. He only mentions the simple costume of the regular priests. The high priest does wear this simple costume when? When does the high priest get rid of all his finery and fancy schmancy stuff and put on the same white simple clothing? Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Exactly, right. On Yom Kippur, when he, when the, when he has to do the most sacred rituals of Yom Kippur to bring atonement for himself, for his family, for the Jewish people, um, he changes into the, um, the simple garments that, that every other priest wears all the time. So, um, you know, when, when, when we ask the question, what, what, what is holiness about? Um, holiness can shift by context, right? Um, when the high priest on a regular day comes into the temple, he must to uh, discharge his holy duties, he must wear a very ornate uh, set of clothes. The same high priest in the holy temple on the holiest day of the year can't wear those, those clothes, he has to wear simple clothes. So holiness you know, um, has different kinds of uh, demands and, and expressions depending on the context. So what, what's this business about, um, what does it say? They should not gird themselves with anything that causes sweat. I mean, if it's high summer, it, linen's gonna cause you to sweat. Cotton will cause you to sweat. So I feel like this is a little bit wishful thinking. Well, um, they, they, so, so it was understood by the sages to mean that this is a, a, a reiteration of the no wool, right? So, oh, so okay. So you, you wear the, the, the linen, it's the best you can do. Don't wear stuff that's going to make you sweat. Why not? What's the big deal? So you sweat. I mean, Jen's saying that you can't even help it. You're going to sweat no matter what. So what is this, what is this you know, uh, uh, attention to try not to cause yourself to sweat? I, I feel like this is, I, I, I know it's probably divine too, but it also might be empathy on Ezekiel's part who has done this job and, or at least whose father did this job and remembers how terrible and, you know, and all miss of fires and a sacrifice and all of that, how hot you can get. So maybe it's just, you know, make your life a little bit easier. Has, has anybody among us ever been at a function or prepared to go to a function and been very conscious about whether or not they have sweat spots on their clothes or, or uh, you know, anything like that? What's that about? Yeah, Geraldine. Well, it's about being offensive to others. What's offensive? When you sweat, you your body creates an odor. Okay, so part of it is just maybe a bad, a bad odor, right? The priests shouldn't sweat, so they shouldn't turn off the people that they're serving, right? It shouldn't be priests. offensive to God. Well, so whether God, you know, is going to be off offended by your sweat is, is uh, you know, a matter of, of speculation. You know, if, if, uh, if the workers uh, who are building the temple you know, work hard, they're going to sweat. Will God be offended because they're sweating uh, when, the, when they're building the temple? Yeah. I would like to think that that's not an issue. We never see it mentioned anywhere. Um, you know, if you're, if you're out there in the, in the fields harvesting your, your crops, you're going to sweat. Does God say, don't bring me first fruits if you sweated? No. Um, so I don't know that God is necessarily going to not be happy with the sweat. But there's a, a, I think that there is a, um, a concern that you're serving the people. And one possibility, as you said, is don't turn off the people by being smelly. 
Right. Also, you might become dehydrated if you sweat, and then your priestly duties, you might not be able to do them as well. Okay, so then that's looking out for the priest, not for the other people, but for the priest's welfare himself. Beryl? I've always thought, well, I've never understood that shotness thing is anything other than um, you have to wash your garment. And when you combine two materials, they shrink differently. And sometimes you end up without a wearable garment. Sweat does the same thing. Um, if today, if you're a $3,000 an hour model, you also wear the best antiperspirant or you'll never be booked again because you destroy the garment that you're wearing sometimes. Right. In the olden days, there was a thing called a dress shield and a model always had that on. Right, right. right. So I think, yeah, so I think that even if, that it's not just about the odor, it's also the look. People didn't like to have those dark patches under their arms, you know, or, or uh, you know, the, or the wet part of the, uh, you know, on your back. Or, or, uh, or, you know, on your shirt or whatever it is. It's also how it looks, right? It stains the garment. It, it takes, it discolors the garment. If, even if the stain doesn't last, you know, you have a nice white shirt and then all of a sudden you've got, you know, part of it is, is wet. So, they never get blood on their garments and stuff? They get, they get blood on the garments, but that's, so... that's part of the service. So what I'm driving at though is that this is a personal leakage right this is this is part of what people don't like um, about showing that they're sweating is that it's about them um, betraying their uh, humanness you know it's it's their their uh, their body is letting out liquids nobody wants to urinate in public and uh, sweating in, in, in is, is sometimes considered, you know, a, a kind of a personal thing that you don't want other people to see. You don't want Question. other people. This raises something for me. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Never mind. I interrupted you. I apologize. Go ahead. And this is probably a rudeness on my part, but I've always wondered, based on what you're saying, why do people who are orthodox, wear such heavy clothes in the summer. Someone explain this to me. It's right here, right <laughs> here. I'm walking down the street on Shabbos. I'm saying, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, read it. <laughs> no, why? That makes no sense to me. So, so maybe we'll come to a little bit of that. I, I, it's a, you know, they have very traditional ideas about what's proper dress and what's not. Um, and they're preserving what they think is uh, the Jewish way of looking. Um, and, uh, you know, your opinion be damned. Um, they're they're going to hold it's on. It's in the to Torah. Them. It's in the Torah. Well, wait, 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 though. In not fairness. Not, not quite. Not at all. No? If you, read, no. If you, if you, read, if you paid attention to what, to what you read, they change those garments when they leave the temple. I see. Okay. All right. These, these garments are specifically abiding by rules only when they're in service in the temple. Okay. And they go out there, they put on their long black jackets, they put on their uh, sweaty uh, hat, they put on the, you know, they, they, they're, you know, they're, they sweat like, like, like demons. So um, what I, what I'm saying is, is there's a some that one part of what we have in our Torah reading is that priests have to be physically perfect. Priests can have certain uh, you know, deformities, um, and it's always a troublesome uh, topic whenever we get to this Torah reading. Um, that uh, um, they have to look like a model. They have to look like what Beryl was saying before. They have to look perfect. They have to be a, a perfect physical specimen. Um, and, uh, you know, partly it's about the, uh, the feeling that when somebody comes into the temple, they're going to be dazzled by the beautiful temple building itself. And they're going to be dazzled by these amazing ministering priests who look gorgeous and, uh, um, you know, are doing everything 
on their behalf because they're serving the Jewish people. They're bringing their sacrifices to God um, and they're doing it without sweating, right? Without, you know, breaking a sweat because this is, they are in this perfect uh, milieu, a perfect environment, and they are the perfect players in that environment. So I think that there's um, a certain element here that carries over from that concern that the temple is the place of physical perfection. The rest of the world is a place of bumps and scars and, and uh, you know, problems, physical problems. But the temple has to be you know, this really special, um, uh, perfect, aesthetically perfect place. Beryl. I, I, one second. I just Beryl, want to, uh, Beryl, Beryl was, was nice. She raised her hand. And then we'll come to Natalie. There are fibers that become see-through when they're wet. And I don't know what undergarments priests are wearing. If they, had to wear, they had to wear undergarments. That's actually mandated in the Torah. So depending upon the fiber of the undergarment, then you, have, you could have a sweating person wearing sheer over sheer, which really could be see-through. And I could see how that would be problematic. Right, you would say it's pasnished. Right. Yeah, Natalie. No, I just want to respond to Audrey that Orthodox people do not wear those garments. It's ultra-Orthodox, certain sects. I know many Orthodox people and Orthodox people, I was brought up with Orthodox people. No one ever wore those garments. I never saw those garments until I moved to New, to New Jersey. So, uh, you know, there's only certain sects that are wearing them. They're wearing them in uh, Passaic and Patterson, but not everybody. And, uh, and uh, you know, I have, I used to do my Zumba and, and I went to these homes and the, 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 the men wear suits. They're in the diamond district. They, they're not, they're orthodox, but they're not wearing those, those garments. All right. There's many, many varieties of orthodox um, right. people. And uh, there's a, you know, a, a certainly the, the orthodox today are not the orthodox of, of your youth or my youth. That's for sure. <laughs> um, they, they've gotten more ultra orthodox, all of them. So the, the, uh, the push for the black hats and for the uh, you know the long coats and so on is is a, is a you know a social reality, but I want to point out even a, a different example, and that is look at um, Bedouin, look at people that that uh, are desert dwellers, and who wear all these robes and stuff, and you know they they wouldn't be caught dead wearing a, you know a tank top and and shorts, you know they they wear all this stuff and and some people think that it's actually better. For uh, for for keeping yourself insulated or something. There's a well, it also way. protects you from the sun. So yeah, so there's you know there's what can I tell you? There's different kinds of uh, uh, approaches that people take. But the here, Muslim people, the Muslim people are wearing all these long uh, things all over the summer too. Exactly, that's what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's so much for sweating. No no sweat. Um, Okay, then we have 19, which we just mentioned a minute ago. And that is when they get out of their uh, sacred precincts, when they leave the temple, they have to take their clothes off, those special uniforms, they have to change and put on regular street clothes. And the, uh, um, the, the verse says, Belavshu begadim acherim, let them wear other clothes. So the translation that we have here is so that lest they make the people consecrated by contact with the vestments. That if they, you know, brush against somebody wearing these holy vestments, then the people will become, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the holiness will, will um, spread, right? Will be contagious a little bit. Um, that's a little hard to imagine that that's a concern. We don't have that um, most of the time in other things. If in, in fact, it's the opposite. Torah is super, super worried about holiness being impugned, being torn down, being profaned by being touched by somebody who's not uh, ritually pure. 
Um, it doesn't usually, I mean, there are a couple of, maybe a couple of exceptions, doesn't usually think of holiness as physically contagious. Um, impurity is physically contagious. If you're impure and you touch me, I'll become ritually impure. Um, so uh, holiness and purity is not contagious, on the contrary. So um, there's a different interpretation that's offered, um, as, far, as I recall it from the Nitziv, Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin. I quoted him last week in the Torah Sparks for other things. Um, and he says that this is, and I, it's an interesting uh, uh, idea that he puts out. He says, when you're, in the, when you're in the temple, as I said before, when a visitor comes into the temple, everything that's happening in the temple is engineered to, to bring the visitor to feel reverence, to feel awe. And that awe works two ways. First of all, you should just feel a little bit like, whoa, I'm in a very important place. Second of all, and look, whoa, this awesome place is serving my need. It's bringing my sacrifice to God. So I'm in very good hands and I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being taken care of in an exceptional way. So awe and reverence are part of what the experience of the temple should be. So the Natsib says, very interesting, he's, he says, once a priest leaves their job, they have no business trying to strike awe and reverence in the uh, consciousness of another person. They're just the same as every other person. Once they get out of the temple, they're not the sacred holy priest. They're just a Jew like everybody else. And therefore they shouldn't be walking around with fancy garments that will make people look at, oh, look, there's that holy priest. There's that really uh, um, uh, you know, special person who has um, you know, uh, uh, powers that none of us have. So he reads the verse as being um, so that they don't, when it says, lo yikatshu eta'am, he says, don't, so that they don't unduly scare them into a reverence that they shouldn't have when it's not appropriate, when it's not the right place and it's not the right time, right? It's not about the priest. It's about the work that the priest does in the temple. Once the priest gets out of the temple, the priest should look like everybody else and should be seen by other people as being just like everybody else. So that's, his, that's his interpretation of this verse. So that back and forth, that yin and yang between outside and inside the temple. Okay, verse 20. They shall neither shave their heads nor let their hair go untrimmed. They shall keep their hair trimmed. No priest shall drink wine when he enters into the inner court. They shall not marry widows or divorced women. They may marry only virgins of the stock of the house of Israel or widows who are widows of priests. They shall declare to my people what is sacred and what is profane and inform them what is pure and what is impure. In lawsuits too, it is they who shall act as judges. They shall decide them in accordance with my rules. They shall preserve my teachings and my laws regarding all my fixed occasions, and they shall maintain the sanctity of my Sabbaths. Okay, so here we gave, we, we, we listened to a number of rules and regulations that are fairly uh, in congruence with what we have in the Torah about uh, haircuts and about marriage rules. There are details that need to be uh, understood and interpreted. There's a whole literature about that. We're not gonna go there. But what's new is the emphasis that we have in verse 23, that what is the job of the priest? So the job of the priest, it's clear from the Torah is be in the, in the, in the uh, um, shrine, in the sanctuary, and take care of all of the sacrifices that have to be taken care of in the sanctuary, like the menorah, of course, take care of the other uh, rituals that have to be taken care of in the sanctuary because nobody else can do that. That's the job as it's mostly delineated um, by, by the Torah. Um, but 
when we uh, come to, to this verse 23, um, what do we see? What's the job of the priest here? It's to interpret the laws for people. To teach to... Torah. To teach Torah. The word yoru is the same root as Torah. Torah is instruction. Yoru, they will teach. They will point the way. They will guide people. Right? So that's an, uh, uh, an important uh, extra emphasis. If we, if we look to Deuteronomy um, chapter 17, um, verse 8, it's on page 1090 in the Chaim Chumash. Oh, do you have that there? 1090, hang on, I'm getting there. Okay, where? Bottom of the page. Yeah. Verse eight, if a case. If a case is too baffling for you to decide, be it a controversy over homicide, civil law, or assault, matters of dispute in your courts, you shall promptly repair to the place, to the place that the Lord your God will have chosen and appear before the Levitical priest or the magistrate in charge at the time and present your problem. When they have announced to you the verdict in the case, etc., 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 etc. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So in in Levitic in in Deuteronomy, we have the acknowledgement that priests will be part of the judge class, right? The class of people who are knowledgeable, who can uh, um, be uh, um, you know appealed to to help decide cases and so on. So, but it also says or some other judge it doesn't have to be a priest. And in fact, that Torah reading is Shoftim and Shotrim, appoint judges everywhere in all of your habitations. Make sure that there's a functioning legal system. Too bad America doesn't have one. So, uh, um, but this is, you know, a mitzvah and, and the priests can take part in that as well. Here we have a much more, um, you know, it builds on Deuteronomy, Yechezkel's point here, 23 and 24. But it, uh, it's a little more of an emphatic role that they have. The priests are not only supposed to be in their ivory tower, they're all supposed to be out there and spreading the word, spreading what this is all about, what this way of life uh, really uh, demands. And they also judge cases, lawsuits too, right? Keep, uh, uh, we reread 24. Yep, let's, let's read it one more time. Lawsuits too. Uh, uh, I don't know, where am I? I'm in Deuteronomy now. No, what? no, you're, you're in, you're at, you're in Shomrei's Zoom room. That's where you are. No, so, am 736, I with 736, 736, verse 24. Uh, bear with me, bear with me. Oh, in lawsuits too, it is they who shall act as judges. They shall decide them in accordance with my rules. They shall preserve my teachings and my laws regarding all my fixed occasions, and they shall maintain the sanctity of my Sabbaths. Okay. So this is um, putting another big burden on them, right? Make sure everything goes right. And when it says they shall maintain the sanctity of my Sabbaths, what does that mean? We have a, a half a minute. One thing is, personally, they should be Shomer Shabbat. Right? Personally, they should keep Shabbat. Does it mean more than that? Does it mean that they have a function to try to promote Sabbath observance among the people? Probably. Probably, yes, because that's why he is accusing at the very beginning of the Haftarah the other priests in failing in their duty and not helping the Jewish people stay on the right path. So because they betrayed the Jewish people in their role as teachers, they don't get to now uh, officiate in the temple. So this becomes 
uh, you know, a, a proto-rabbinic uh, kind of uh, position as well. Okay, we'll leave it here for today. And I wish everyone a good week. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.